the University of Texas in Austin through the Great Learning Platform at the top of my cohort. He works as part time senior education instructor at Space Center Houston, a, sign, a senior volunteer at the George Observatory, and a part time volunteer with the Asperity Observatory in Humble, Texas. He is currently working towards improving the science activities and projects with Dr. Andrea Ortiz, uh, the new science research manager at Space Center Houston. With that, let's welcome Justin McCullough. <laughs> One other thing for our speakers, we had some complaints about our audio not being good, so try to kind of stay in front of the mic if you hear yourself coming through the PA system, the people online can probably hear you. And Justin, would you rather have the lights on like this or turn them all off? Probably have them all off. Oh, got it. I'll take care of that. Given the type of uh, the nature of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, so we'll start this. <coughs> So this uh, basically is, is an experiment that I have my students perform in their astronomy labs whenever I teach the class. That's right. Off. 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 Yes. Off. And this is based on an experiment that actually has an origin in the 17th century. And this is based on the uh, concept of using the orbit of Io, a moon of Jupiter, to circle around Jupiter. <laughs> in the attempt to search for a method of measuring longitude out at sea, but end, ending up discovering that the speed of light is actually finite. Uh, that's my particular background, so 20 years of astronomy and physics education. What we'll do here is that we'll go through a review of measuring longitude at sea optimi by optimizing the eclipses of the Jovian moon Io, with the discovery that the speed of light is finite. So here we have the history and origins, <clears throat> the events leading up to the experiment, uh, the technique and execution of the experiment, and the applications and results. How do we apply this, let's say, to Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede that try to reproduce it with the other moons of Jupiter? Now, Ole Romer, his alma mater was the University of Copenhagen. So he was a Danish uh, astronomer born in 25th of September, 1644. His mentor was this man right here, Batholin, who basically is famous for basically looking at the double refraction of rays of light through calcite. This was done in 1668, and this was from spars from Iceland. Uh, one of the first things he gave Romer was his opportunity to actually go to Tycho Brahe's astronomical calculations, actually look at all the data that Tycho Brahe collected over many decades to master the field of astronomy and mathematics. Uh, he was tutored by Louis XIV of France to be the tutor for the Dauphin, the, basically the son and heir to the king, and participated in the construction of a lot of the advanced and very magnificent fountains for the Palace of Versailles. He introduced a system for weights and measurements for Denmark in on the 1st of May of 16, it says 1963, that should, actually should be 1663. So that's something I need to work on. But actually convinced King Frederick of Denmark in 1700 to, to, to adopt the Gregorian calendar. Tycho Brahe tried to do that a century earlier, but even in 1600, not a lot of people were, were all jumping for the, uh, for the Gregorian calendar. Now, one of the things Robert did is actually had his own scale for measuring temperature. Prior to that, uh, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit, for which we have the Fahrenheit system. The basis was using the freezing and boiling points for water. So in the Romer scale, the freezing point was seven and a half degrees, whereas the boiling point was 60 degrees. Then we had Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And you can look over here where you can take stuff from Romer for measuring the Romer degrees and putting them into Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, even Newton and Romheiner have their own units for measuring temperature before we became more standard with Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. And then if you want to go to Romer to measure the degrees in Romer, there's the conversion here. Here we got Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Now, <clears throat> the Rune Tarn is this building right here near the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. This is not the original observatory. This is a newer version. The old observatory has been replaced elsewhere as an exhibit. But from the mid to 19th century, 
the, this telescope right here, known as the Mishina Domestica, which was built by Romer, originally had it in his house in Copenhagen, and then it was moved here on top of this, this octagonal tower. That's the Rudetarn. And his idea was that instead of using quadrants and sections at the time of Tycho Brahe with the upcoming of telescopes, and with telescopes being the pervasive instrument of the 17th century, basically the days of quadrants and sections had long since passed. Now, this is a very interesting telescope. It's on an east-to-west axis. It's the first instrument built for looking at the transits of the moons of Jupiter. It's permanently fixed along the meridian. It was equipped with complete circles. It was put in his house in 1689. It was five feet long. He actually had a special light source put in front of the objective to light up a series of wires of 10 transit and three declination wires for, for being able to do an ocular measurement of the movement of the moons of Jupiter as they shift around the planet itself. <clears throat> he mounted the scope to one end and the flexure was compensated with counterweight. So basically it was not centered on the central mass. He didn't touch the telescope directly. He had a very specialized mechanism here that, counter, that compensated with counterweights to be able to adjust the telescope along the length of, along an angle of 75 degrees to properly line up the scope. So he operated with a fine handle. That's the handle he used. He actually had a special metal box for his writing utensils. And basically he had developed all the main features of a modern transit instrument. And 1704, he constructed the first meridian circle to look at the movement of objects along the meridian. And he had very accurate, fully graduated declination readings so that he could actually measure the declination of objects across the sky. He invented a series of instruments along the meridian, developed the modern altitude azimuth system, and stuff dealing with the modern equatorial, that is along the celestial equator. He was first to measure what we call the trineum, which is a series of stars, in particular aries, and declinations, right ascension and declination for longitude and latitude in the night sky, and did that over a series of consecutive nights. And he was actually employed by this individual here in 1760 to actually investigate the proper motions of stars. It was as early as the 17th, as early as the late, well, late 17th and into the 18th centuries, where astronomers began to realize that they could actually figure out the actual motion of stars with respect to the sun. These are some of his achievements in terms of improving the Copenhagen's water supply and sanitation systems. He actually was the second chief of the Copenhagen police. He was the first to invent street oil lamp lights for any city on earth in, in sort of the pre-modern era <coughs> in the renaissance of scientific, uh, the scientific renaissance of astronomy. And that was around the time of the late, well, I forgot what the year was. It was in the late, uh, late 17th century. And of course he died on in 1710 at the age of 65 in Copenhagen. Dustin, I got a question for you. Yeah. On that slide, you said he fired the entire police force. Yes. Why did he do that? Well, well the, the police, police force was somewhat, somewhat incompetent. They were bad at, uh, at getting to fires. And he thought they were very inefficient and low morale. So he fired them all and built a whole new police force from scratch. Okay. <clears throat> now, the issue is, I'll go through this very quickly. The problem is navigation at sea. For centuries, with the use of the sextant, mariners were pretty good at looking at the position of the sun in the northern hemisphere and looking towards the crooks of the southern constellation in the southern hemisphere to know about declination for latitude and longitude, or looking at the sun at the the sun at uh, at the at the solar noon when it's at it, when it's on the meridian at its highest point in the sky, and comparing that with Greenwich, England, to determine their latitude on the surface of the Earth. But longitude is a serious problem, how far you go east or west. So it's a matter of timing. Because you have to remember that for every one minute of longitude, it's four minute difference between sunset and sunrise. And if your sunrise and sunset is off by half an hour or 15 minutes, you can be hundreds of miles or kilometers offset from your particular location where you're wanting to go. So instead of ending up going to, let's say, to New York, you probably end up somewhere up in Maine or far south in 
South Carolina. Uh, Philip III of Spain in 1598 actually offered a prize to really develop a chronometer. Now, <clears throat> there were the developments of telescopes and pendulum clocks, but telescopes are very good for looking at your position of longitude on dry land because it's a fixed location. Pendulum clocks are better suited out at sea, but look at how ships have to deal with the rough and tumble of the waters. It's pretty difficult to try to measure any position of any object in the sky out at sea when your ship is sort of wobbling back and forth in heavy seas. But Galileo thought it was a good idea to look at the timing of the eclipses of Io, and observing those changes in timings can be used to determine longitude, so, since we can relate longitude position to differences in times when the sun will rise and set. The British, <laughs> looking to develop a good chronometer, actually passed the Longitude Act with the British Parliament in 1714 to get, every, to get see who could develop the best chronometer to measure the time difference with British England to measure longitude. Now, this is uh, Giovanni Cassini, for which we have, for which we named the Cassini spacecraft after. <coughs> he was uh, a contemporary in the time of Ole Romer, and the one thing was that he made the first successful measurements of longitude using the eclipses of the Galilean satellites and using that as a clock, because there's a periodic motion to the Galilean satellites that you can use as sort of a measurement of time. He adopted the method proposed by Galileo. He actually published a lot of tables. Uh, there is Jean Blow's atlas from 1663, and that's a layout of Tycho Brahe's co uh, complex, his observatory. This was his castle right here, his house. <clears throat> he actually had this person right here, uh, Jean Picard, who was a contemporary of his, sort of a working colleague, and the idea was for the first project when he created the Royal Observatory for France under Louis XIV in 1671, was to actually go to uh, Tycho Brahe's old observatory, which was still up, all the buildings were there, all the facilities, all of the pre-telescope instrumentation. We have to remember that Tycho Brahe didn't use any telescopes. He really was a visual astro astronomer with quadrants and sextants to actually measure the positions of stars and planets in the night sky. So he went there to observe time and record the eclipses of Io. And this is uh, his Iranian board, which is the place for Tycho Brahe's observatory on the island of Heven, and that's off the coast of southwest Sweden. <clears throat> this is actually one of a few documents that survived. There was a great fire in the library of, of uh, the University of Copenhagen in 1728. So a lot of Rover's papers were destroyed, but those that survive actually show the timing of the eclipses right here for Io in its orbit around Jupiter. There was a comparison of the results and looking at despite the differences when the eclipses occurred around midday, because with the telescopes they had, they were able to see Io bright enough in the telescopes at midday from the separation of Jupiter. And under the good sky conditions without a lot of sky pollution and humidity, you can pick out Io <laughs> and the great moons of Jupiter during the daytime when they're far enough away from the sun and see how they move with respect to Jupiter. But that was the timing difference right there, 42 minutes and 10 seconds, when they observed the eclipse during the time of day, and that produced a difference in longitude calculation between north and south. This surviving manuscript right here, one of four pages, shows 60 observations of Io eclipses from 1668 to 1678. So when you have more tab tables of data, to look at more and more of the eclipses of Io, you can better time when those eclipses are going to take place and predict when the eclipses occur. <clears throat> so well known by the 17th century, 42 and a half hours. What's interesting is that you get two types of Io eclipses. When it immerses, that is when it goes into the shadow, and when it moves out of the shadow, the emergence. Since it's 42 and a half hours, there's no way you're going to see a complete eclipse in one day or one night. <clears throat> but there's the limitations of Io's motion and the limitations of nighttime because it's not possible to see immersion and immersion, emergent and emergence for the same eclipse event. What's interesting is that before conjunction and after opposition, you only have the emergence. But the angular separation between Io and Jupiter is only increasing, whereas if it's after conjunction and before opposition, you have only immersion where you have a decreasing angular separation between Io and Jupiter. 
That is when Io goes into the shadow of Jupiter, when it's coming out of the shadow of Jupiter. <clears throat> so this actually comes from a publication that Ole Rummer made in, had published in 1676. What's interesting is on the quadrature points in L and G, that is, those quadrature points are important because based on where Io is going to be located, and if you see Jupiter with respect to the Sun, usually when you have a quadrature point, it's because if you have Jupiter, let's say one of the quadrature points there, observed from the Earth, when you're going to Jupiter, there's a 90 degree separation between the Sun and the Earth. So if you are observing Jupiter in any of those quadrature points, it's very important because then you can see the shadow off at an angle and be able to properly time and observe an eclipse of that of Io. Otherwise, if uh, Jupiter is right on conjunction, well, it's blocked out by the sun, but it's at opposition, then Io is being occulted by Jupiter. The arc length itself is for a 42 and a half hour period and you have to remember that the diameter, the distance between the Earth and the Sun was not known at all. So they had to do measuring light speeds and distances based on multiples of Earth's uh, diameter. And the presumption is the time difference over that distance in which the Earth travels in its orbit from L or K or from G or F, they come to a time difference of three and a half minutes. And that assumes uh, the light speed is about one Earth diameter per second. But here we have an increase and decrease as Earth is approaching Jupiter and is moving away from Jupiter as, as it orbits around the Sun. <coughs> now these were observations in the spring of 1672, a long series of observations. We have the total accumulation versus the calculated, and the difference is 32 seconds, some errors are by minutes, but they were starting to sort of home in on that 42 and a half hour period for the orbital motion of Io around Jupiter. Uh, Romer and Cassini equally calculated the time approximating Io's orbit. Uh, there are some inequalities, meaning that, and it's assuming that Io's orbit is circular. They didn't know that, Io, that the moons of Jupiter were elliptical orbits. They only thought that applied to the planets orbiting the sun. <clears throat> but what are the irregularities here? One, of course, is not knowing the eccentricity of Earth's orbit and the eccentricity of Jupiter's orbit. You can calculate it with Kepler's laws, but you have to remember that if you're off in the eccentricity of it, it can affect the motion of Jupiter across the sky, particularly when it's uh, doing its epicycles and the irregularities of the days, because the days vary in terms of the amount of daylight. But a new irregularity was the finite speed of light. So there had to be publications made all the time to republic to republish the periodic motions of Io and the orbital period of Io and its prediction of the eclipses. And that means you're having to reset the clock after Jupiter's opposition because of those irregularities. So they really had to start off new with a whole different set of tables working from the previous tables because they had to, have to sort of reset the clock because they didn't know fully these irregularities in the orbits of Io and Jupiter. <clears throat> but we do have that publication uh, the Journal des Savants from 22nd of August of 1676. And that shows you that diagram right there and the publication of the data of Io's emergence prior to publication from those events. And that was before even Cassini made his announcement in those publications. Here's one of the original publications for the eclipses. And we can see they generally somewhat agree roughly to 42 and a half minutes. I was able to find this. It was not easy to find, but it's in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage. Have everybody ever heard of the JAHH? If you want to know about the history of how astronomers understood the night sky and in research then versus now, that's a very good publication. All right, so we have, we, we went to determine the table of planetary positions, both for astronomy and astrology. So there was sort of that commonplace in coordinate transformations, because not only they were doing this for astronomy, but also astrology was still very big, even in the 18th century. Uh, there's a formula in trigonometry called the law of cosines, and that's for comparing the positions of Io, Jupiter, and the Earth with respect to the Sun when predicting the eclipses. Now, the Earth-Sun distance was unknown, so the Earth-Jupiter distance was based on a multiple of Earth-Sun distances, but that was still an unknown parameter. 
meaning they didn't fully understood the, uh, the nature of the astronomical unit. But there were 30 eclipses of Io that were taken between 1671 and 1673. Uh, the best fit they found was about 10 minutes for the predictions. Well, for about 10 minutes when the light would travel from Earth to Jupiter or from Jupiter to Earth, Earth to Jupiter, Jupiter to Earth, they thought Jupiter, they thought the planets radiated light like the sun. They, it wouldn't be until right around the 18th century they fully understood that that the planets didn't generate their own light. Light was being reflected. They were taking light from the sun, reflecting off the surface. And that allowed them to do predictions for August and November of 1676 when the next set of eclipses were going to take place. <laughs> it was widely accepted but not universal. Cassini had his particular objections because he didn't fully accepted the idea that uh, the speed of light was finite. Some thought that if Io was appearing here when it should appear here, one well, of the effects could have been atmospheric refraction. Uh, Christian Huygens, though, looked at the difficulties. He did sort of measure higher. He did measure the value for C when he tried it with the other moons, such, such as with Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede, but because their orbital periods were a lot longer, it's much harder to catch with them undergoing a shadow when they're going into eclipse and out of eclipse, when they're going into the shadow and out of the shadow of Jupiter. So there were much higher errors for measuring the speed of light. So why does this work for Io and not for the other moons? Well, with rare opportunities to see the eclipses of those moons, you don't have a lot of table, a lot of data to work with. Uh, Cassini did put corrections and irregularities that unfortunately contradicted Rover's theory because there was still the idea of an infinite speed of light or that his calculations for the speed of light using Io's orbit was probably the incorrect method. But Huygens, you can see right there, more than 600,000 times larger than the speed of sound, which is not the same thing or same things as being instantaneous. So, you know, he told Cassini, I'm sorry, I have to agree with Romer. The speed of light is finite and his value came to around 600,000 times the speed of sound for the speed of light. <clears throat> Who also accepted the idea? Well, John Flemstead accepted the idea for the ephemeris for the eclipses of Io. So he not only accepted the orbital, the, the, the value for 42 and a half hours for the orbital period of Io, but also being able to predict the uh, when Io is going into eclipse or coming out of eclipse. But Edmund Halley, Sir Isaac Newton, and Robert Hooke, which we have Hooke's Law, Sir Edmund Halley for Halley's Comet, Sir Isaac Newton, for his laws of physics, accepted that there was a finite theory for the speed of light. Uh, in fact, when he was doing his Principia, he used a lot of uh, uh, trigonometry and, ge and geometry theorems to justify and, and prove the nature of the finiteness of the speed of light. But the eclipses of Io did determine that the speed of light was finite, even though it challenged Kepler's laws of planetary motion because they're not time dependent. Yes, you can relate periodic motion to orbital distance, but it's not like you can use those laws to determine where an object is going to be at a certain particular time. <clears throat> but we had some people to help out. One thing was that this man right here, James Bradley, he was the third astronomer royal for the Royal Astronomy. His work on the measurements of stellar aberration where the position of stars are going to be as they change with respect to the stars in the background, the stars in the constellation, as the Earth orbited around the sun. With a bit of math, he was actually was able to calculate the journey of the light coming from the Earth to the sun and from the sun to the Earth. And it turned out to be about eight minutes and 13 seconds. And this was in 1727. Now, this will be very important because this will allow astronomers to precisely be able to determine the Earth-Sun distance, the astronomical unit. Then we have these two gentlemen to thank for, Joseph uh, Louis Legendre and Pierre-Simon Marquis de Laplace. What's important is that these are the pioneers of classical and analytical mechanics. Now, Cassini and Picard could not explain the nature of the finiteness of the speed of light. And <clears throat> astronomers were able to calculate the speed of light around the time of the 18th century, between 301,000 to over 300,000 kilometers per second. But with more data, with better time instruments and better methods for measuring the positions of objects in the night sky, that is better astrometry. You could time the IO eclipses. 
the orbital structure and distance. What's important about these two gentlemen is that their equations, here are their original writings, they could better look at the nature of energy, force, velocity, distance, and time. And that led to the foundation of classical mechanics. So you come down here to this periodic right here, you can use those equations to better predict when the orbital motions of Io is going to show, when there's a shadow, when, when there's going to be an eclipse, and when there's not going to be an eclipse, without having to do a lot of observations. And then this man right here, Delambre, <clears throat> he was a French mathematician, astronomer, historian, and geodesist. Basically, he looked at a century of reported observations, and he was able to increase the precision and being able to measure, better measure the light time travel for the Earth's sun distance, he got to about 8 minutes and 13.2 seconds. And look at the values we have here. Now, Robert was not very precise, 214,000 uh, kilometers per second. That's in modern units. I'll show you we can do better than that because of the technology at the time. But here with the aberration of stars and Delambre working with Legendre and Laplace's formulas, look at that, 301,000, 300,000, 300. That's in 1726 and 1809. So that's pretty, that's, that's fantastic. <coughs> uh, one of the things was looking for, there was some resistance. This man right here, Louis, uh, Louis Fizeau, Armand Fizeau, actually created this common path interferometer, thinking that he could see the change in the speed of light with respect to the aether. And the aether is basically the so-called substance that if it changes, it will change the speed of light. And the idea is that he would look at the speed of light as the water was flowing towards and away along this pipeline here. And with this fringing, he thought by looking at changes in the fringing with different wavelength, with different uh, types of light, he thought that he could use basically the wavelength of light as a fixed value. That is, everyone thought that the wavelength of light was a fixed unit of distance. Excuse me? Yes. W. What's that? In this equation, what is W? Is it the velocity of water? Yes. We're, we're dealing with the velocity of water. And what he found is that the velocity of water going one way actually impeded the speed of light. And then is the refractive index. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> this is, of course, Michelson Morley interferometer experiment, where you actually, what they were looking for was trying to measure the aether. And this was actually the most failed experiment because the purpose was to measure the wavelength of light as the standard of length, uh, measure the properties of the luminous aether, and was looking in search of the aether wind because it was idea was the idea was that as the aether changed in its density, that it changed the speed of light because the idea was that since you have mechanical waves like sound waves moving through air and through water. They figure that there's an aether that is some sort of substance for light to, to travel through. Well, <clears throat> here they were looking at the changes in the in the this pattern of light here, these these uh, fringes, and the idea is that the fringes changes with according to a substantial part of the wavelength of light, then that would indicate that there was an aether, that there was a change in the speed of light itself. But the measure was so minute that it showed no difference where you positioned the beam splitter and the positions of the mirrors and it showed no difference in, in the deviation in the fringes with respect to the wavelength of light as a fixed length of distance. And what that showed was that basically the speed of light was being uh, a constant. And then later on we had Lorenz and Einstein with their transformations in special relativity which debunked the aether. So all the idea about the wavelength of light as being a standard unit of measurement and the fact that there was somehow an aether, that literally stopped because what this showed was one, there was no aether, light can move through space, and knowing that frequency and wavelength change with respect to each other shows the consistency in the speed of light, then that means the wavelength is not a fixed length at all. <coughs> so did Robert discover it? Well, uh, I will say this about this gentleman right here. In his documentation, he actually took a lot of the data in terms of multiples of the diameters of the Earth. In his documentation here, this is an old human right here. A toise is basically like two meters. 
And what did Fontanelli showed was that using the data from Romer, he was able, able to take the value in Earth-based units the first time ever in leagues per second, in Earth diameters per second, and that's the speed right there in kilometers per second. A league varied much depending on what country you were in. Basically, a league, the idea of a league is a distance a person could walk in one hour. So if you could walk a certain distance one hour, that was considered to be a league. Like 20,000 leagues under the sea, what is a league? Some countries had it at 1,500 feet, other countries had it at 5,000 feet. The Doppler method was very valuable because now they can look at the speed of light in terms of using C over V. <clears throat> and Romer had very high inaccuracies for measuring the speed of light because of poor knowledge of Jupiter's orbit, but up until the time of Bradley, before that, no one knew about using C over V as a means of with, with using stellar aberration, finding the position of stars across the sky as they shifted as Earth orbited around the sun to calculate the speed of light. Well, here we got 22 minute light travel time equals one single Earth orbit diameter. Okay, so we're going to quickly go through this in terms of the experiment. What do we need to do? Well, we assume that Io is the same distance as Jupiter from Earth. We predict the positions, what it will be, what the current position is versus what it would be if there was no light speed. Record the separation of the angle from the center of Io to Jupiter. Record the current time. Wait for Io to appear at the predicted position. Record the new angular separation. Record the new time. Assume the distance has not changed considerably. Since the IO distance from Earth was not known, look at the time difference and calculate the speed of light. <clears throat> so what we want to do is look at the pre and post solar conjunction and opposition. So you'll have a one to three month window on either side of the solar conjunction or opposition. So you want the phase to be anywhere from 99% to 99.7%. There's no way you're going to get Jupiter less than that. It, it, that's going to be when it's at its quadrature right here, where basically, if you're on Jupiter, Ju the Earth and the Sun would be separated at 90 degrees. So you have to record Io's current position versus its predicted position. You have to see when Io disappears into the shadow, when the eclipse is going to take place. You know, there should be a huge change in the light uh, travel time, a huge change in Earth-Jupiter Earth distance. This was the assumption uh, using the old version of Ole Romer's experiment, look at the time difference for the new predictions and calculate the speed of light. That's around that past or before or after conjunction, before and after uh, oppositions, where opposition is here, here's the Earth, there's the Sun, and then with Jupiter, it's on the other side. If it's a planet orbiting closer to the Sun than the Earth, it's a superior conjunction. One thing is that with orbital social mechanics, one thing about Laplace and Lagrange is that they were able to do, introduce with gravity orbital resonance, working with Newton's laws. And that means when Ganymede is orbiting Jupiter once, Io is orbiting four times. When Europa is orbiting Jupiter twice, Io only orbits once. So when Ganymede Basically, it's a two-to-one ratio with Ganymede with respect to Europa. So Europa orbits twice around Jupiter as Ganymede orbits once. And that's this gravitational tug of war between the three moons and that of Jupiter. So what has that done for us? Well, we know that orbital resonance. Well, look at what we now know about uh, Io's orbit. We know about its furthest and closest distance. We know about its orbital eccentricity. We can measure the orbital period to within a fraction of a millisecond. We can look at the changes in orbital in the orbital in the orbital velocity. Actually, that should be the average orbital velocity, not the average orbital period. The average orbital velocity is 17.334 kilometers per second. The inclination with respect to Jupiter's equation equator, so it's a very the orbit is not very well tilted. There's the orbital inclination with respect to the plane of the Earth's orbit, which is the ecliptic. The major, the semi-major axes, the orbital circumference is basically more than 2.6 million kilometers, and its average acceleration around, going around Jupiter is around 712.5 meters per second squared. That is a fancy formula using the law of cosines. So basically, 
these are the radius. This is the radius of the orbit of the Earth. This is the radius of the orbit of Jupiter. <clears throat> this is the angular velocity of the Earth, measuring degrees per time. The I represents the ith orbit of the ith period of Io, you know, whether it's the tenth or the twentieth orbit. This is the period of, of Io's orbit, which is the P. D sub one is going to be the distance when Earth is closest to Jupiter. That's the change in the time, and that is C. So this comes from a publication in 1988, and this is what they use for the law of cosines to try to measure that speed of light. Because remember, you're not dealing with a right, when you're doing this, you're not dealing with a right triangle. You can't just use Pythagorean's theorem because all three angles are going to be are, are going to be anything other than 90 degrees. So you have to use this to look at the difference in the positions of the Sun, the Earth, and, the, and Jupiter with respect to each other to try to find those <laughs> angles to try to measure that speed of light. <clears throat> What's good about that is that we can actually look at the changes in the distance of Jupiter. So we have the right here, this is the difference in Earth. So here we get the Earth and Sun pretty consistent only a slight variation in the difference between the distance of the Earth to the Sun, Jupiter to the Sun, but look at the difference with Jupiter and the Earth. So when it's up here, we can find that the distance between Earth and Jupiter is greater than the distance between Jupiter and the Sun, and when it's down here, it's still greater than the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but less than the distance between Jupiter and the Sun. So that means the Earth can get closer to Jupiter than the Sun will ever be to Jupiter. And here we look at this pattern right here of the distance that light travels from the Earth, from the Sun to the Earth, so, uh, Io's orbital period, and all that is very important when looking at how we're going to be able to do this experiment for measuring the speed of light. And one thing is looking at positions here. Uh, you may not see this, but this is when, this is actually a shadow right here. I actually built this from scratch, but that is the C represents Io going into the shadow, and be just before shadow. Now, if we see it like this here, obviously we're going to lose Io behind Jupiter because it's going, Jupiter is going to occult Io. Io is going to hide behind Jupiter. But if we have Jupiter like this, then what happened here is that Io will disappear into the shadow before it goes behind Jupiter, as we see from Earth. So we get our dates for conjunction and opposition that we can predict. And right here is where I actually did an experiment where we look at <clears throat> the elongation in, uh, actually that is the, uh, this is actually the solar elongation. So this is what we can predict when Jupiter is going to be closest to the sun in terms of its angle and when it's going to be in opposition opposite. And so we want to get one to three months on either side of the conjunction or opposition so that we can be able to see the planet disappear into the shadow. That allows us to predict our four dates right here. Three in 2024 and one in 2025. So when I give my students when they're doing the class, this is the table they have, so they have to record the time, the angular separation, the Io Earth distance, the velocity, they do it with and without light speed, and then they wait for the object to go to the new position and then record the new time. Then we look at the time difference, we convert that to seconds, and calculate the average velocity, and there's the formula right there. Uh, Stellarium, I use it, they have an m kilometers, just multiply that by a million, and you get that, uh, the, the distance in millions of kilometers. So we go into Stellarium in the night sky, we see here is Ganymede, there's Europa, there's Callisto, we don't have Io, but that's the pathway of the shadow, so the phase is 99.7%. <clears throat> so this is post-solar conjunction on the 31st of March next year at 8 p.m. So we have our information right here. So this would be the position if the light speed was infinite. That is, this is what we would see if the light traveled towards us right away. There is the angular separation of Io and Jupiter in arc seconds. This is the distance from Earth to Io. And with Stellarium, one of the things we can do is that we can look at the change in angular separation by 0.1 arc seconds every second in Solarium for a time difference and see the difference between Io and Earth's distance by as, much, by as little as a thousand kilometers. But yes, there's limitations to Solarium. There's limitations if you actually do this 
in your backyard, depending on the equipment and computer technology and how you gather images. But I will say this, this is what it would be with no light speed. This is what it would be with light speed. So you can see the difference between here and here. So we look at where we were predicted. Predicting, generally, <coughs> we would see it here. But right now, we can see it here with light speed. So we have to time it when Io goes from here to here when it's leaving the shadow. And the light travel time would be about 48, 7.1 minutes. So we do that in seconds. So no light speed versus light speed. So here we can calculate the predicted Earth Io distance, particularly if it's going to be in the shadow. And when it leaves the shadow, we get the new distance right here and we can calculate the velocities. And then when we actually see it leave the shadow and becoming exposed to the sunlight, we can measure the distance again, time it, and get a velocity. Sometimes these two values should be the same, sometimes they're different. But we have to remember we're comparing the new time. That's actually the old time. This is actually the new time. We're looking at no light speed. So at no light speed, this would be the old time with the light speed when we're trying to get to this point right here versus what we're observing because of the delay because of light speed, that's the new time right there. <clears throat> and so what we get is that we end up getting a average value here. Here's the accepted value for the speed of light. And when we look at these uh, predicted versus the observed versus measuring from the predicted, we can see a difference of only point of less than 0.7%. So we can actually measure within a few thousand kilometers. So I'll go through this very quickly. Here's a table. So you can see where we can have the velocity, the distance. When you are further away, you actually get greater prediction than when you are closer. <clears throat> it's just the nature of the window of observing and how we measure those positions based on just the nature of Io's orbit as it appears when Jupiter is closer being versus that being further away from the sun and with respect to its position from Earth. So here we have our values right there. So it's pretty accurate. We have a confidence of nine, nearly 99.9%. .9%. So there's our uncertainty, that's the variation, and that's the value we get right here. So it's pretty close to the 300,000 kilometers per second. So we can do this with the moon of Europa. Pretty good confidence right there. You see how that's close? There it is with Ganymede. It's a bit further away. Remember, Ganymede orbits further from Jupiter, so there's less, uh, less uh, eclipses to record, so there'll be higher error because we have to remember that the orbits of the, of the moons are not fixed. They're wobbling around Jupiter because that can affect the timing that takes place when predicting the eclipses. So you have to correct for that. And this is for Callisto, which is more inaccurate. <clears throat> let's see, it's around 303, close to 303,000 kilometers per second. But we have to remember that sometimes Callisto doesn't project its shadow on Jupiter at all when it's in transit because the orbit is pretty well tilted. So looking for when Callisto is in shadow is pretty rare because sometimes Callisto is usually at the north or south pole, polar regions of Jupiter when it's in transit. But if we average out all the values there, you can see we have about 301,456 kilometers per second, which is not bad. It gives you a variation. It gives you a confidence of 99.5%. So with modern techniques, we can apply all the moons, take into account orbital resonance, orbital tilts. And you can see the range there is not that bad. It's, it's pretty good. At the extended value of the speed of light, we're over 303,000 kilometers per second. One of the things I had to do was show the table of formulas here for measuring out the ellipse, because one thing you have to realize is that Jupiter is only about 1,500 kilometers from the center of Io's orbit. So that means Jupiter is barely wobbling around itself as Io orbit orbits around that. And if you know, let's say, the semi-minor uh, axes, well, you know the semi-major axes, which is taking the furthest and closest distance that Io is to Jupiter or with any body orbiting around a central body, you can figure out the major axes, you can determine the position of the focus, that is, subtract out 
Take half of the major axes, which is the semi-major, subtract out that short distance, and then you can use this to find the semi-minor axis. So that allows you to know the ellipse of any body orbiting around a central body, whether it's the Earth going around the sun, or Jupiter going around the sun, or Io, or any moon orbiting around a planet. And this is what I did here for my data. So I tried this, and you see I got an average velocity of close to 302,000 kilometers per second, but the data was pretty tight, so the confidence was pretty high, and I showed it here in terms of multiples of Earth diameters, light travel time, astronomical units, using the accepted speed of light in meters per second and in kilometers for that Earth-Jupiter Earth distance. And worse, Io's position is going to change versus here, and the predicted to when you actually see it go into the shadow itself. So now we can do this in terms of Earth diameters. In fact, when Earth is going from B to B prime here, when going into the shadow, the difference is 20,000 kilometers. So that's nearly 1.6 Earth diameters. And you may not see this very well, but this is actually, this was taken with the Gemini Observatory in 2014. So this is actually Europa eclipsing Io. And I know I'm officially out of time here, but I gotta show this. Because you can see, you see these spots right here? Those are the calderas erupting. There's a dark lava flow right there. And if you actually look at the video of this with the lights, you'll actually see these patches here, which are sort of the ice cracks and ridges of Europa itself. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. This is what I do for my astronomy students. Yeah. This project you're doing with the students, is this like one lab or is like a semester project? This is one lab. One lab? Yes. They only do it with one moon, I am. But how would they gather the data? Do they just use... They, they, use, use, they use Stellarium. They use Stellarium to gather the data. Yes, and they still get percentage errors. Okay, so you're not asking them to go out and gather the data? No. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. That would be too much for the students, for my 1,400 students. If they were... If they were like 2,000 level astronomy students, okay. then yes, I would do that. Okay. Who, who else has any? Yeah, yeah. probably answered this before we got in because we were late. I apologize for that. But this whole time I'm wondering why IO? It was the first idea originally used as a chronometer to try to measure time related to longitude because mariners were looking for means and governments were looking for means to find longitude out at sea. And they found that Io could be a good clock because you can relate distance to time. Because with longitude, if I go one minute this way in longitude or one minute that way in longitude, then there's a difference of four minutes between sunrise and sunset, whether you're here or there. And they used this as, well, this was the first idea is using this as a chronometer to try to measure longitude out at sea by looking at when Io is gonna go into shadow. Actually, I had a second. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned Galileo. I mean, he had an ankle bracelet on from the Catholic Church for the rest of his life, and these guys all worked together. How much uh, were they sort of the minority? How much opposition did they have doing all their research compared to basically everyone thinking that we still revolved around or the planets revolved? What about not heliocentric, but the other one? Well, a lot of these astronomers were not were were in a lot of the countries that were free from the Catholic Church from the in during the Protestant Reformation. So they access the information. And the, and the kings of France were a bit more liberal than the, the, the princes in Italy who were pretty much hamstrung because the Catholic Church had dominance over Italy. So the information got out despite being suppressed. There was no way to stop the publication with the printing press. Yeah. You, uh, there was a note in between somewhere that there is a Kepler's laws are challenging. But I thought that if you use the elliptical orbit, it is... <coughs> Not to, I mean, Kepler's law is always satisfied. <laughs> they couldn't use Kepler's laws at the time, Io's orbit, because they could use it to generally figure out the motion of Io's orbit without knowing its distance. They had to do it in multiples of Earth diameters. But it's not like you can say, oh, after five sec after 15 hours, it's going to be here, and after 20 hours, it's going to be over there. Because I think the calculation shows the error percentage 
if you connect it to the error percentage of uh, some of the like you know you are using other data which is also to some extent approximate yes, so sir. in that way if we do it we i think it can give very good results <laughs> well i'm really surprised that how uh, accurate it could be well, with Lagrange's equations and with Newton's equations, as they came after mm -hmm. Kepler, they could rework Kepler's <coughs> equations to make them more precise in terms of time dependence. But at the time, Kepler's formulas, they had a very limited uh, accessibility of what tools they had available because they didn't understand orbital resonance. Gravity was unknown prior to <laughs> Newton. Galileo's idea of, of the nature of gravity was sort of rudimentary. And so the Kepler's laws were not as sort of sophisticated then as they are now. They became very <coughs> dynamic through the 18th century. Yes. I believe it was during the Cassini mission that the volcanic activity on Io was first identified by a JPL person trying to recalculate the trajectory. Is it possible that that activity was enough that it was blurring these observations 300 and 400 years ago to make them less accurate? You mean the volcanic activities? Yeah, because the edges wouldn't have been firm when they were going in or out of eclipse. They would just be seeing Io as just a little circle. They would not have noticed any of the effects from the any volcanic that. activity. No. concept of calderas was in a paper that was actually published by astronomers in the 1970s where they were noticing as Io passed in front of Jupiter that the planet was changing its shape and they were looking at sulfur in the spectrum and came to a possible idea of volcanism on Io. But that was very controversial prior to Voyager 1's flyby. Any other? Yes. I had a question. So that, that eruption right there, is that, is that, um, is that from that particular orb or is it from the, the passing? That was from the, that was taken on Earth. But the Gemini Observatory. Okay. They actually observed it. Is it a, is a piece a piece of the planet falling into that in particular, or is that just a self eruption? Oh, you mean the calderas? Yes. Those are eruptions on the surface of Io. The moon itself. It's not Jupiter. Okay, it was not piece. No, that's your moon actually occulting Ju actually occulting Io. Okay, I just thought maybe it's a rare thing to see a moon occulting another moon. The, lab, the only physical records I know of this last time this happened was back in the fifties. Everything we have to line up. That's your question? Yes. I mean, it goes from itself, not from the <coughs> Jupiter pieces of Jupiter, gra the gravity pulling toward it. Uh, part no, of Jupiter. No, if, if the cold air is erupt, that material is actually flowing along the magnetic field to Jupiter. Okay. So or the eruptions. Yes. Okay. Well, no, I thought it was the other way around, where, where like something was pulling it toward it and it hit it, and then when it's, once you go inside of it, then it erupts. No. A piece of the piece of the Jupiter. No, you're dealing with a body of rock orbiting around a gas giant. Any other questions? No. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, Justin. I can see it's been a lot of work in that between the sixty degrees and. Okay, Ron, would you like to say a few words about the DVD library? <coughs> sure. Um, if you've been here a couple times, or if you plan to come back, you're more than welcome to take on. We have like 200 DVDs. Um, you'll see on the on the slide there, the ones on the right, the Infinite Cosmos, is uh, produced by Astronomy <coughs> Magazine, and they're about 45 minutes long. And on the left, you see the great courses. They're 10 hours plus. So there's a legend on each topic to tell you who produced the uh, DVD. But, um, oh, and we also have uh, uh, sky atlases. We have three, we have planispheres. So if you're gonna do observing, you gotta have them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Ron, we're gonna take a break here in a minute and Ron will be up there if you guys wanna get a DVD or a sky atlas or a planisphere. Uh, go see him and you can check one out and um, bring it back sometime in the future. So thanks for bringing the DVD library this time, Ron. Okay, so the meeting after the meeting. Uh,
Uh, a lot of times we get together like this, we don't really get to talk to each other very much because we're all sitting in chairs watching presentations. But you guys, when we get together afterwards at Mod Pizza, it's your opportunity to get to talk to each other a little bit. And uh, the Mod Pizza we go to, you zip up Middlebrook, and we get to Brooks, the Boulevard, the left, and right from HEB, it's that Mod Pizza <coughs> here in Colorado. And I really see the whole thing. We'll be getting together there after the so We're going to take a short break. We'll take a 10 minute break, and then we'll get back to the second half of the break. I'm going to talk to you about this. Are you reading? Oh, I'll do it. 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 I
frozen sulfur dioxide. And so that's all that's like. Yeah, it's basically a cold era. But wasn't it was it was it part of you want to see it? Oh, okay. So you're that eruption. Yeah, it's that No, the two moons are separated by hundreds of thousands. That's a line of sight. You can have two hands like this like these far apart. That was enough to make the tape if you saw them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, one question. I did that with the eclipses of the moon. It's pretty close. I know. I'm kind of surprised. Thank you. I need something. Oh, and I need something. Actually, I need right? Yeah. Okay, good. Can you imagine what the night sky is? I have a question for everybody. Do you know any fine donation of the planetary? I have a planetary. And then so they might stay. But I don't have money to buy the projector. Small projector. So I thought that I used to have that in the city. Sometimes these places want to go out and she's called a facility. I need to see the charts. And they might have to go through a lot. some story. <laughs> That's what I need. Yeah, yeah, but I don't have any text. You can see it. Oh, yeah, you're good. 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 you are already been back from yeah. scratch again with and the pancake. I've got the, this one. So. Uh, that is much better than that. Yeah, of yeah. Oh, yeah. Usually, a lot of PhDs, they say just do for it. Yeah, we used to work oh, yeah. just until they retire. I have gone from it. She has to call me by one day. No, no, not really. I mean, I'm, I just bought a solar telescope. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 I just bought a solar yeah, kind of PST of so I can I've been um, hoping I just didn't look at the annual work now. I put on when I was out. That was a dry run on how to use it for the total I have to take Oh, that Coronado PST. The last time I took it, I was looking for don't ever take this to a star party. Start at night. Or go straight to it. Well, I'm all the time. My ranch is not real. My old red. Well, this is just. Charles B. Wendt, just talk west of Kaufman. Did you learn about the optics of the human eye? Part of the red head. Actually, we're not really saying it. Oh, right. That's why at night time I always get red head. Yeah, because if you stay in a room with white light and go up the night sky, it's like a green and it's in the sun. Does it have to do it like that? It's like a PST magnetic spectrum. It's thousands of times. White light is thousands of times more intense than this. Oh, so we don't notice it. What you're doing with five, you see, this is a thing we call back into the for measuring the brightness of the sun today. Five magnitudes is other types of brightness. If you look at the Venus galaxy and tell you the first out of the full moon, the difference in brightness is hundreds of millions of times. No, so simply going from negative 12 to half magnitude with the moon, down to let's say 20 magnitude. It's logarithmic. Like that was all over the equation. It's the 20th power. It's two and a half times the brightness of whatever magnitude is just on and off. I don't know. So you go from first 
to the daughter time work right now. He actually was my uh, go from first to ten magnitude, then it becomes a hundred thousand times as bright. Just like Tim said, it's orders of magnitude. Fact, you know, we have deals with the R. It deals with one over R squared log combined with the log with I guess log with the second right thing. And I'm here. I'm here. My son's a big man with my wife. Right here, smart. Right. So, during the new event, it was like there were so many cancellations. We were able to get one of the names there. Left there. Left and left there. Left. And it was it was amazing, you know. You just sit out there for half an hour, and you look up his visor. Yeah, it was he was amazing. He wants to be a ray in the pleasure in the spotlight. Two years ago, he wanted to be a voucher. So man, now he wants to be a cheer. It was about two years ago. You want to be like me, or yeah. right? I was going to call it. So I'm sitting in the casino. This trip's like a casino. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Again, that was a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, I'm, I must, you must give you a lot of uh, I do. speakers. Although I need to have more rough hands like you. <laughs> 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 Handshake there. I'm to the I actually was able to find that. No, that was that was all the guys doing all that, but they all, they all, they all believe, believe or did they understand the heliocentric or were they more focused on this was heliocentric, yes, yeah. this was heliocentric. All the guys all they all were like no everything's revolving around us. This is post this is post Nicholas Copernicus. Okay. 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 He's one of the common Well Hipparchus actually There he is. <laughs> actually is our Aristarchus. So actually had documentation that's only been recently been discovered. We came up with the idea. Now that I got the new handset and it's in um, I'm just trying the fourth to century it. BC. You know, I, the knowledge was lost. It's supposedly to get against you, but then there were really. But even the pagan Greeks rejected the idea of heliocentrism. The mean centrality of the Greco Roman gods about all that. If you're the centrality of the cosmos. Now I just can't start to believe it's just so heavy. Well, that's us in our modern thing. But the ancients had a, had a slightly different right. mentality from their cosmological point of view. But that was so around the uh, that, 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 But you have to understand the way they saw it. No one ever thought the idea of the Everybody thought the universe were all planets, the earth, including the sun. Nobody thought of the sun as being this gigantic body that's like a million times the size of the earth. That the sun was probably a ball, only maybe about this big. Here, this was very bright, and then you have the celestial sphere of stars, but, okay. all, all right. circling around, all circling around the earth, and the earth was stationary. Yeah, well, the problem was the emphasis one of the complications. That's what I was going to say. They, they use a lot of the planting systems. Yeah. 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 So that's why we're going to get an ratio. So now they can practice all the way. There's some guys that my job that try to break I don't I don't know. John Salinas is for my He's actually, he was my mentor. This company right here. Yeah. What does your company do? I got a little bit of 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 a little a little more artificial intelligence. Okay, so they are. This one he wants to do biomedical engineering, which is going to be making the robot, robotic parts and using AI. So, yes, we're going to start on this year. I'll get you. Yeah, he likes to do that. Who are you two guys? No, uh, I'm Jack's dad. Mason Morgan. Morgan. Yes, sir. Morgan. Yeah, and I'm mad. I'm a friend of Morgan. I mean, yeah, Matt, 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 I'm a friend of Morgan. Oh, it's Matt Morgan Jack. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Why don't everybody? Matt Morgan Jack. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, so we're going to get started. And you're happy with it. Like I need to start yes. with my oh, really yeah. 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 Uh, tale of five radio telescopes. So it turns out, as like we know people in our group, there's actually quite a few people in our group that are interested in radio astronomy and have been diddling around with this for the last several years. So I'm meeting more and more of you that are doing this, which I was surprised. I thought I was the only one, but not. So why radio astronomy? So from Mark DeChellis's talk last month. He pointed out to us that there are certain wavelengths of light that make it through the atmosphere at certain moments of time. So visible light, you know, makes it through our atmosphere, and that's why we can look out and see <laughs> celestial objects, take pictures and things like that in visible light uh, bands. But also radio waves down here also make it through the uh, atmosphere as well. So that means that we can do radio astronomy from the ground. So last month I showed you my new seven-foot. Uh, 2.1 meter radio telescope, which I recently put together in the backyard. There it is. <coughs> All right, so this month um, I want to show you five feed antennas designs, complete and partially tested, show you some test results from these. So, a feed antenna, so the way a radio telescope works, this is the dish down here. It works a lot like a mirror on a telescope, it gathers the light, you know, and it focuses up to the feed antenna. So this, it assumes it's like a mirror and optical telescope that focuses it, gathers you know, as much light for the aperture and it the here. And this is more, this is kind of like your eye or camera of a radio telescope. So the first design was a 3D printed <coughs> pyramid horn, called pyramid horn because it's shaped like a pyramid. The second design is a helical beam antenna. And they call it that because there's a helix of wire that goes around and around this tube here. And the helix, so they call it a helical beam antenna. This, this design, this gray stuff on the outside is just duct tape that's holding the helical uh, wire in place. And there's a ground plane on the back of this. So the design of this, the circumference of this is 0.732 lambda, lambda being wavelength. And this is a 3.087 turn helical beam antenna. The third design <coughs> I'm going to show you is a 2.1 turn helical beam antenna, but it's a little wider as you can see from this. And it's a 0.898 lambda uh, through. Uh, circumference design. This one down here is a cylindrical waveguide antenna. The di diameter is 0.722 lambda. So this is actually just a piece of aged back uh, duct pipe. And there's a quarter wave antenna that's put right in here. And then the fifth design is a loop antenna. There's a wire loop right here. And this is put inside a reflector. This, this is aluminum. Uh, Pan that has the re this reflector here, and this one's a little different. It actually has sides on it, which are kind of they actually act, act as a choke to uh, block radiation off to the side. Where this one has ground plane, it's a flat surface. This one has a flat, but also has edges to it. Okay, so um, all of these test results are all 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen from the Milky Way. So when the Milky Way passes over, what I'm doing is I'm getting the peak signal that I get at uh, 47 degrees declination, where the, the radio telescope is pointed. So what you're seeing is actually the neutral, <laughs> the neutral hydrogen in the Milky Way as it passes over. So the pyramidal horn, um, which was my original design, gave it a very small signal. So the signal to noise ratio peak, which is the peak of the signal here down to the noise, this particular one only gave 0.25 dB. The second one, the helical beam antenna, the, the uh, 3.087 turn helical beam, did it quite a bit better. Uh, 1.07 uh, dB, you can see here, looks a little better than that one. Okay, then the third one, the other helical beam antenna, the one with 2.1 turns, uh, got a little bit better, 1.36 decibel. And this is one I was putting the LNA, which is the low noise amplifier, down at the end of the cable here. And then as Carrie and other people will tell you, don't do that. I knew that all the time, but Carrie reminded me last time during the meeting about I shouldn't do this. I should move this thing up to the antenna. I think you told me that, right? You were right. So I moved the, the uh, LNA from the end of this cable up to the 
actually to the back of the antenna and I gain a little bit more, got a little bit bigger signal. And the reason that helps is because when you've got it down here, this is just picking up the noise from the, the cable itself and also there's some attenuation in that cable too. So it's a good idea to put your LNA right there on the back of the, uh, the antenna itself. The uh, circular, the uh, sorry, the loop antenna, which is a, I don't think I said, but it's actually a one wavelength uh, loop here. This one, um, I got 1.09 dB. And then with the cylindrical waveguide antenna, which is going to be the best one, I was able to get 1.977 dB. That's the best signal I was able to get. So there's a couple things here. You know, you also see this doesn't have a lot of rank up in it from, uh, you know, interference that you see in some of these designs. So this particular, you know, this dish antenna is doing a couple of things. It's giving a pretty good signal, but it's also blocking all the crud from uh, man-made uh, signals around, which I saw with my other uh, radio telescope. Okay. Um, so what should I, so what should we expect? And I think I told you guys last time I saw this why because this Antenna, the aperture of this antenna is like more than five times larger than my previous one. I was thinking, you know, five times more, I'm getting like five times more signal, which is over six dB more, and I'm not getting that. So I was disturbed by this. I was trying to work all this through, through but there's a very nice Facebook group, uh, Amateur Radio Astronomy. And I posed my question to this group because people have larger dishes, small dishes, and they're doing all kinds of projects. I said, you know, what kind of signal? Why would I get the kind of signal I thought I would get? It turns out you can a rough calculation you can make um, if you know the absolute temperature of this thing that you're measuring. You can use Boltzmann's constant by using those two. You can actually calculate the spectral power, which is watts per hertz. Okay, so if you look up in an astronomy book like Foundations of Astronomy by Seeds and Beckman, it'll tell you what is the actual temperature of these H1 clouds. And this is not this is actually the temperature of the clouds. If I went out there with a thermometer, set so my thermometer in this in the Milky Way in the neutral hydrogen, this is actually what the temperature of this would be. And so that temperature is between 50 and 150 Kelvin. So for my calculation, I'll just go right in the middle and say it'd be 100 Kelvin. My LNA, which is a little $40 El Cheapo one, but you know, that's what I'm willing to pay for it. It has a noise temperature of uh, 59K, 59 Kelvin. So uh, it turns out that most of your noise in a system like this actually comes from a low noise amplifier. You can look at that. There's others, lots of other sources of noise, lots of other problems, but just for a rough calculation, we'll say it, the majority of our noise is coming from that low noise amplifier. So if you calculate this, you take the 100K from the hydrogen you're actually measuring, and you divide that by the 59K of the low noise amplifier, what, you're going to, what I get is around 2.29 decimals. And when I compare this to these guys, this is the radio astronomy uh, group, that's a Facebook group, that's about what the best of the best getting. Like this one guy's been doing this for years, and the best he's ever gotten is like 2.5 dB is the best he's ever gotten with his antennas. So this is about... This is about what we would expect. So I was thinking I was going to get like 6 dB or some great thing with my big dish. But it turns out because of the temperature of the thing you're actually measuring, the noise of your low noise amplifier, you're actually limited to about, you know, 2 to 2.5 two ish dB is about as good as I can get. So all you guys doing that and you're out there and you're thinking, why am I not getting a bigger signal? Uh, it's not you, it's actually the thing you're measuring and how noisy your LNA is. You can get better LNAs or lower noise, but they're very expensive. Okay, now this is a movie that kind of, I hope this works. This shows you, hey, it worked. Okay, so this is over, uh, this is a, I think it's about 17 second video, but it's 24 hours compressed into 17 seconds. So this is Stellarium up here. You know, Justin was talking about Stellarium a little bit ago. Our antenna is pointed at about 40, seven degrees and it's right over the center here which is somewhere right there i'm trying to put my glasses on but it's somewhere right in there is where the antenna is pointing so when the milky way passes over you're going to see this little blip down here that's that's the neutral hydrogen the, that the uh, radio telescope is actually detecting you guys see the blip get bigger and it goes away right because then the milky way goes away now Neutral hydrogen actually the wavelength is 14 or sorry, the frequency is 1420.4058. So it's about like right here in frequency. Anything that goes 
to the left of this is lower frequency, which means it's red shifted, it means it's going away from us. Anything to the right of it is blue shifted, it means it's coming towards us. So what we're doing, that this was just neutral hydrogen, it was not moving, we just see a, a sharp spike and that would be it. But the red shift and the blue shifted is evidence that the Milky Way, some of it's moving towards us and some of it's moving away from us. And also, you'll see there's actually a point here during the summer Milky Way when it goes over, you're going to see the three bumps come up. You're going to see right at the peak of this, there's going to be three bumps, one, two, three. That's evidence that we're actually looking at multiple arms of the Milky Way. So we look at that, and I've told you guys this before, but now that you're seeing it live. Okay, so that's you're looking at this. The, the big bump is the, the arm that we're actually inside. The other two bumps are other evidence that there's other uh, arms of the Milky Way past the one that we're in that we're actually getting a measurement of. You guys believe it? So. They use that as evidence that there's more because you know we're inside the galaxy, we can't see outside the galaxy. This is one way they prove themselves that our galaxy has multiple arms to it, not just this one. So. Okay, so that's that. So have you tried to aim it near the center of the galaxy? Just see yes. how big of a signal you get? Yes. And in fact, if you were here three years ago, <laughs> which yeah, I did that. I, I actually what I did, I did all the um, every 10 degrees with the other one. If you look on my web page, there's actually a 3D <coughs> plot that shows, it's kind of cool. Okay, look, look on my web page sometime on radio astronomy. And I did a, a three, I did a 3D plot of every 10 degrees with the, my other radio telescope. And actually, the coolest thing of it is you can actually see where we're located in our galaxy. Because it's really cool, because at the point where it's, the whole thing shifts from redshift to blue shift, is about a half to two thirds out from the center of the galaxy, which is how far we are out from the center of the galaxy. So that's a way you can measure in your backyard, you know, how you know, prove yourself that we're actually that far out from the center of the galaxy. So I thought that was pretty cool. I told a lot of people that they're kind of like, eh, who cares? But you know, I think that's pretty neat, you know, if you can actually do that yourself. Make <laughs> and this is true because I mean, this is kind of, this is proof that we actually have, or evidence that we have multiple arms in our galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so any questions about that at all? Yes. That frequency you mentioned, that corresponds to 21 centimeter wavelength, is that right? Yes. Okay. 21, 21 I'm sorry. Why, why is hydrogen, neutral hydrogen emit at that wavelength? Is that a transition from a ground state to a first excited state or something? Yes. Okay. What it is, is, okay, so you've got your hydrogen, your proton, you've got your electron. Electron has a spin to it, right? So when the, when the electron changes its spin from one direction to the other direction, it puts off that wavelength. It goes from, I guess, from a higher energy state. I'm, hold on. I know she's going to answer. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Let me finish. And then you become a more intelligent answer. Okay, yeah. So my understanding is there's this, there's this electron spinning like this and switches from this to the other state and puts off 21 centimeter hydrogen uh, wavelength. But the cool thing is this was predicted long before someone ever measured it. They actually predicted this, and then people went out and measured it and actually found it. Now, so Justin and Dr. Masood are going to tell you something much better about this. Tell, tell us, Justin. Are you going to say something? Yes, Justin, you can ask. You can, you can go ahead. Well, I was just about to say that it's usually just, you were close to the fact that you have to remember that when you're looking at electrons, they don't jump from orbit to orbit unless you give them enough energy. If it's going to be a microwave emissions because the hydrogen is neutral. So when you have the electron, if it's oscillating or vibrating or it's changing spin, without changing from orbit to orbit, then it just simply will just radiate that 21 centimeter radio wavelengths. But the hydrogen is going to be neutral. It's not going to be charged. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not ionized. It's not ionized. The, the electron orbit is not changing from one state to the other. It's just changing spin from one spin to another spin. Would you agree with that? <coughs> that's, that's what I've heard. OK, Dr. Masood, tell us. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it is uh, this uh, emission of light is basically related to within the atom. It does not come out. That is called ionization. This light is emitted when it shifts from one orbit to another orbit, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it goes. Excitation. Yeah, yeah. 
DX, uh, then it de excites, and during de excitation, it emits light. Oh, no, this is not changing orbit. This is changing the spin. No, suborbit, subshells. What? Suborbits. Suborbitals. Like SP, I mean, if you understand that much in chemistry, PX, PY, PZ, if they move around, even then they can do. From S to P orbital, they can, there is a little change of energy. See, wait a minute. You don't think this will change spin from one spin to the other? They, they can move around. If there, is a, if there is a single orbit, when it moves, it creates kinetic energy. That kinetic energy appears in the shifting. But it cannot, it does not have enough energy to go further. So it just changed within orbit because it is empty. In hydrogen, it is empty. Yes. Okay, this thing is like the spin of one half to change the spin of minus one half. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes. Change the spin. These are like. Uh, there are orbits and then there are suborbits because electrons don't actually circle around, they actually sort of whiz around in these electron clouds. Yeah, but that is with more electrons. Yeah. Now, and, and the reason you see this is because, you know, it's not like, you know, one electron, who cares? And, this, and, and also, this only happens like once every million years or something like that. It's because there's so much hydrogen in the Milky Way. That's why we see this at all. There's so much of it. Uh, that's, that's why we see this effect. Actually, there is a lot of hydrogen, so that is more possible. Isn't that what I just said? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. That the only reason that you can see that, of course, you know that. By the way, I'm going to ask a very dumb question, and that's why I was laughing that what you are introducing me. You were talking about different designs of uh, telescope. Thank you. So I was asking, yeah, when you talk about different designs, uh, to me, since the uh, um, surface surface area or the area which is absorbing it will be affected. So how much it will affect the results? Because the collection of data or radiation or radio uh, waves, if it is a larger antenna, it will collect more radio waves. Right. If the uh, it is smaller, it will collect lesser. Like when you have this type of uh, this design, and that dish design. Right. There should be a difference of results. Okay, that's what I thought last month. But the bottom, the reason I was uh, not thinking correctly about this is, is because what you're there's always going to be some limitation to the signal noise ratio of based on what the temperature is of the thing you're measuring versus what the noise is of your system. So no matter even if I got the biggest dish in the world, if I got a noisy boy noise amplifier. It, it won't help because my noise level might not be high enough. No matter how much I gather, it will never. It will still be limited by my low noise amplifier, and limited by what the temperature is of the thing I'm measuring. Okay, okay. Carrie's going to tell us. So uh, your noise floor must have also came up. Maybe you just haven't noticing it. Maybe that's where your figure and kind of came from, maybe or whatever. But if you took this. To the extreme, then you shouldn't need a big antenna at all, right? You just want a, uh, you just want a low noise amplifier. <laughs> uh, that is correct. Yeah, he's right. If you're always limited by the noise of your system, it doesn't matter how big your antenna gets. Uh, can you do anything with the low noise amplifier? I mean, can yeah, you, you, can you cool it down more? Can you I tried this. I tried cooling. It didn't make any difference. It made a difference. No. But yeah, that, that is kind of disappointing. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of like, okay, it's kind of like this. Say you get the biggest telescope in the world, the biggest mirror. If you got a crummy camera, if your camera's just noisy, 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 it doesn't matter how big your mirror is. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big the mirror is. If you're always going to have a crummy signal because of your so you crummy camera. It should still have better resolution, though. Yes. yes. That's correct. I'm That's really correct. Concerned. He's right about that. My my old my old uh, one only had the actually I'm, I'm twice as good a resolution now with the, the bigger um, dish I have the old the resolution is better. So the spatial resolution is better. So, so what's your limiting factor now? What? What is your limiting factor now? Is 
Is it still the low noise amplifier? Well, okay, it's, it's low noise amplifier, but it's also what the thing I measured, the neutral hydrogen, no matter what I do, it's going to be around 100 degrees Kelvin. That, it's never going to be brighter. Or, that's, that's the way it is. So it's, it's the dimness of the thing you're measuring you know, versus the noise. Now, I'll tell you something else, Chris, though. You think about it, you start thinking, why don't you just stack a whole bunch of them together, right? Like we do in imaging. Okay, this is all, everyone I'm showing you here, they're all 902,000 stacked together. So when we make an image, we may do like 10 or 20 stack those together. And for an optical image, this is 902,000. So what that got me was, if you look at the original noise, it's at minus 50, D 55 dB. Mm -hmm. So after you stack 902,000 together, it winds up being the noise floor winds up being around minus 70 dB. So it does improve the noise quite a bit so you can actually see your signal. But there's this limitation, just like in images, there's some point where after you stack so many of them together, you don't really gain anything. You know, it's kind of like levels off. And that's where we're at. And there's another thing, Chris. I don't know what I'm doing. Because <laughs> it's, it's really the truth. I really do not know what I'm doing. Well, you moved the LNA closer to the antenna, obviously. That was why well, I knew that, but Kerry reminded yeah, me last time. Uh, which is going to help. That's why you are doing. What? Because that's why you are doing, because you want to learn. <laughs> I know. Yeah, people tell me things I'm doing wrong. Yeah. This is how we do experiments. We want to learn something. That's right. So we'll, we'll keep making progress. And I'm sorry, what? I said a question. So inside your dish, was the shape, the pyramidal shape, is that a common or recommended shape of that unit for that type of a machine? Is that okay. something you see often, or is that your own choice? Okay, Morgan, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Morgan and Jack. And Matt, right? Yes. Okay, okay, you guys. Yes. Um, okay, okay, so long story, but a long time ago when I went to KU, I studied electromagnetics, okay? That's why I thought I was going to do this antenna thing, but then I was sort of Worked for NASA, they wanted me to do digital cameras. I forgot everything I knew. So the books I have from KU told, said that this pyramidal horn thing was the El Primo super duper design for this dish antenna. And I thought that's what I'm going to do because that's what I learned in school that this is the way to go. So I made this thing and it didn't perform very well. But I don't think it's necessarily the design is bad. I think it may be the implementation. This is a 3D printed horn. And what I did is I spray painted the inside of this with this this, uh, this conductive spray paint, and I think the are you laughing at me? So I'm thinking I'm thinking that maybe my spray paint is not good enough, and I'm going to go back and revisit this. This is actually a really good design. But so you said your future learning your your other profession is what they use that shape, the pyramidal shape. You said. Well, when I went to school, that's what my books that I have in school, I have like three antenna design books, electromagnetics, but this is kind of what they believe. But the Facebook group, they're all doing this. And there's another guy who's not here, Jerry Campbell. And Jerry may be listening to this so you can hear his name, you know, during our meeting. But Jerry's making this design, a variation of this design. And a lot of the people in the Facebook group believe in this as being the answer, this uh, cylindrical waveguide horn. Okay. So, but the, the real truth is really hard to, um, electromagnetics is really tricky. It's hard to calculate. It's hard, to, you know, you basically once you have to test it in the end. You try to calculate it. Like all these, all these antenna designs were all designed. I used, these are all mathematically designed. But then when you go out there and you actually test it, they don't do what you think they're going to do because there's some problem with your implementation or your, your design method. Does that answer your question at all? It sure did. <laughs> yeah, this, this is the Facebook, guys. This is my KU Electromagnetics book. This is also my KU Electromagnetics book. I really like these. These are kind of cool. This is another guy on Facebook that came up with this thing. This is a cake pan, a uh, six-inch cake pan, and he put this circle with this uh, uh, loop antenna in it. Are you going to say something, Dr. Sue? I just have a little comment. I may be totally wrong because I don't really do this. But is it uh, something related to that? Because it, it, it should depend on the design. If it is wide, it might be covering more range. Yes. And when it is like this type of compact design, I, I mean, I'm talking about every compact, depending on number of tons and everything, yes. it will increase the intensity at the cost of at yes. the expense of range. Okay, I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, 
Now, okay, here's what here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get this thing so this this like this antenna design is down 10 dB at the edge of this antenna. That is kind of like the way what you want to do. You want it to be 10 dB. You want it to be great in the middle, and then you want to 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 be 10 dB at the edge. And you don't want to be able to be sensitive past the antenna because then you're picking up the ground. The, okay, think about this for a minute, guys. What what is room temperature? In Kelvin, yeah, about 300 Kelvin, right? The thing I'm measuring is 100 Kelvin. If I'm looking at the ground, if I'm looking at the grass in my yard, that's 300 Kelvin. That's way, way hotter than is my thing I'm measuring in space, right? Yes. yes. So I don't want this antenna. I don't want this thing to be. They call it spillover. But I don't want that to spill over. What? Yeah. Why do you talk about grass if it is the plain uh, floor, like the <laughs> no cemented floor? It will have even more higher temperature near the ground. Well, no, I mean, if it, or instead of grass, you have concrete, then it well, will have higher temperature. No, I, I'm in grass. That's what I'm talking about, grass. Yeah, no, the, I just wanted to bring that up. That yeah, 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 it, you're right. But the point is, you're <laughs> You, you want to you design this thing so it's down a certain dB at the side, and you don't want to go beyond your dish, or else you're going to be picking up something hotter than the thing in space that you're trying to measure. So every one of these is trying to get this, and then they, then there's, there's there's major lobes and minor lobes. You know, some of these things actually have lobes sticking out the back of them. I mean, you want the thing to be sensitive to the front. But the truth is, like this one here, the notorious for having uh, minor lobes are actually coming out the back. So while I'm pointing this way, you know, this thing may be, you know picking up the a tree or something next, you know, to it. So you want, what you ideally want is you want this thing to have a pickup pattern just goes directly in this dish and doesn't go anywhere else, but it's almost impossible to get it to do that. And that's what, that's what the objective of all these different signs of ours to try to fill the dish and nothing else. Is that what you're, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I just took it for granted that if you want, you can change the orientation also. Like instead of having it parallel to the ground, you can put it perpendicular as well. You can. So, I can't. I, I move the dish all over the place. But, so that's why, like, you know, what? Uh, uh, that's why I thought, uh, said that the area will increase, but the intensity will increase because there will be, uh, like, you know, it will keep on uh, segregating or extracting the same wavelength more than more than average okay like if it is just one wave or if it keeps on collecting together right that will affect the total in a total collection yes. or total data yes what you'd like to do is you'd like the, the entire signal that comes off the dish yes. to go right into your antenna and go to your your you know the antenna inside the antenna yes but, but trying to get it all in there and nothing else that's what the challenge is and, and this one here, for example, this uh, loop antenna, it's actually it's actually got a dead spot, like straight through the middle here like this. It is completely dead. It doesn't pick up anything. That loop antenna actually actually picks up out to the side. But people, because of this, this uh, collar on here, people have had good luck doing this by having it dead in the middle, but having it just pick up on the sides. Mm -hmm. But you see, for my, you know, for my results, this one did not perform as well as the cylindrical wave line, which is actually a forward pattern. But do you have them equal distance from the ground? What? Do you set them at the equal distance from the ground and you compare different designs? I'm not understanding. What? Okay. The then you put it over the ground. Are they situated at the equal distance from the ground? Yes. Then Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a, okay, okay, but, okay. There's a focal point. This is a this is a parabola. So yeah, parabola that's what I wanted point. to ask. But the tricky thing is, Doctor Masood, the focal points of these things, like the focal point on this one, is right there at, at the mouth of this antenna. Okay, so this is answering your question. So you got this whole big thing hanging out past the focal point, right? This one here, the focal point actually is right there in front of that that thing. So there's nothing behind. it. See, so there's, there's, they're not all in space exactly the same place. These different designs have different amounts of the antenna at different locations because the focal point of the feed horns on these things are not in the same place. This guy here, the focal point is right, right, well, right inside the, the aperture. 
This one here, the focal point, is actually on the back plane of this, this dish. So they're all different. They're all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions about this? I'm so glad you guys like radio astronomy. I, I think about 10 of you are really excited about this, and the rest of you think this is awful. Could you please move on? So <laughs> okay. Anything else? <coughs> Sorry I took so long. I know it's painful. For some of you, but some of you just love it, so that's Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. Okay, so next up, we have Phil Stewart who's going to tell us about his, his measuring of Barnard Star. So we discovered Phil at the last meeting. We found this guy's been doing all kinds of cool astronomy projects. I asked him to come and do a talk tonight. He's going to tell us about the things he's been doing on Barnard Star. Take it away, Phil. Okay, uh, like you said, I've been measuring Barnard Star for about the last four years. And first off, a little bit about it. It's called Barnard Star because E. Barnard is the first person to identify this an interesting star. It's fairly bright, magnitude nine and a half. That's a red dwarf in Ophiuchus over here. So it's really a, a, a summer object. It's kind of a bad time right now to look at it. So, oh, about to go behind the sun. Sorry. Um, but anyway, why am I interested in it? Well, one thing is the closest star to the sun that we can see from here. The uh, Alpha Centauri system is a little bit closer, but it's only visible from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it's also the star with the largest proper motion. So, you know, the stars really aren't fixed. They move around. Most of them are so far away, though, that you can't tell they're moving. Far large stars can actually detect uh, motion in the star. And then finally, I want to measure the distance to it. And the best way to do that is the closest star. That's the easiest one to do using parallax. And so I want to do those two things, find its proper motion and see if I can measure the distance. Uh, now, talking about its proper motion, just to show you how big it is, the uh, left-hand picture here is a photograph from a uh, Burnham Celestial Handbook taken in 1960. It's kind of a bad picture. It's got really fat stars in it, but I really like it because I was born in 1960. Uh, the uh, little yellow arrow there points to Barnard star, as does this little asterism of um, stars over here. Some people call this the uh, flying geese. It also points at it. Uh, the second picture is one that I took about a month ago, and it did a lot of post-processing to make my stars as fat as the ones in Burnham, so you can compare them easier. The, uh, this is now Barnard start up here with the arrow, and you can see it's moved uh, quite a distance. To give you how, an idea how big that is, the right-hand side is a picture I took of the moon with the same telescope that I did for this 2023 image. Uh, and they're, so they're same scale, so you can see the distance here compared to the moon. In my lifetime, it's moved about a third of the diameter of the moon. Still not a huge distance, but it's something that's easy to detect. Now, for measuring the distance, like I, I kind of mentioned in there, I use parallax. And just in case anyone doesn't know what that is, the stellar parallax, <coughs> what we've got here is the sun at the bottom with Earth going around it. And then we have a star we want to measure, this nearby star. And in the background, we have some very distant stars. And in this thing that I stole from Wikipedia, they put the Big Dipper back there. So the idea is whenever the Earth is over here, uh, you look at the star and you see it behind these background stars. In this case, it's a little bit to the left of the bowl of the Big Dipper, and you get a picture like this in the lower right-hand corner. Six months later, when on the other side of the sun, you see now the star in a different spot than the background stars, in this case, in the bowl of the Big Dipper, so you get this picture. And so as the, sort of the Earth orbits the sun, you're going to see this star move back and forth relative to the other ones. And that's how we can measure the distance, because you can take half of the angle that's, that it changes from one six-month period to the next, and uh, you know the distance from the Earth to the sun, and you can use simple trigonometry that tells you how far away the star is. And so, so that's my goal, to measure those two things. This is my equipment. This is my uh, uh, lead six inch or eight inch F10 telescope. It's been Cassie Grunt. The camera I'm using is the ZWO ASI 1600 Cool MM. It's the monochrome version. Don't use any of the other stuff. I, could, I have all kinds of little projects I like working on. Those are only two components I really needed for barn over. No filters, no bar looks, no focal reducers. Uh, the exposures I take are only two seconds long because it's a bright star and they'll saturate if you go longer than that. And that makes it hard to measure the, the uh, positions accurately. Uh, I take generally 30, 30 images per night, just one right after another, and I stack those to get my noise down a bit. So that gives me an equivalent of about a one-minute exposure. And I've been doing this for a little over four years, done 204 nights. 
I've got a whole lot of pictures of Barnard Star that I can try to measure. And what do you do with those pictures? Um, well, this, like this is an example of a picture that also fuzzed up the stars a little bit. Here's Barnard Star. You all these surrounding stars, you know the locations of. What you can do is interpolate their locations to find out exactly where Barnard is on any given night. Uh, there's a few issues with that. You know, whenever I first did this, I used a plate solver, and I was getting errors of about 15% on this on this parallax. Um, now, someone said you really have to be careful about the colors of stars because there's the Earth's atmosphere acts kind of like a prism and it smears out the, the light from the stars. And depending on what color it is, it'll end up in different positions. And that can cause very tiny errors that mess this up. So I did like he did. I went down to using just two stars. These two stars circled here, they're very red. Like it says, our stars are red dwarf, so it's very red. So by having all red stars, you won't have a, an issue with that. So I wrote my own little program instead of using the plate solver, and it just takes these two positions and interpolates. The other thing that I just figured out last week you have to uh, really worry about is atmospheric refraction. Uh, you know, as things get close to the, the horizon, the atmosphere becomes thicker, and the uh, pathway that the uh, sunlight or the starlight takes gets bent. So objects appear higher than they actually are. Their apparent position is higher than their true position. And whenever you have a picture like this, these stars are at different heights above the right horizon. Maybe, maybe about only 10 arc minutes or something, but it turns out that's enough to totally mess up your calculation. And so I have to correct for that. I use a very simple equation called the Venice equation to take these true positions of the red stars, convert them to the apparent position that you'll be able to photograph through the atmosphere, then interpolate to Barnard, use Venice equation to undo then the uh, atmospheric correction go back to the true position of Barnard's star, do it 204 times, and you have all the pictures analyzed. Uh, then, to get a little bit better, I curve fit that. I use a technique that's uh, given by this URL at the bottom of the page. They've got a very nice setup, just kind of cookbook you can code up yourself to uh, take those positions and curve fit them, and then from that, back out what your parallax and uh, proper motion are. So here's my results. The left-hand image is the big one, the one what I really like. All the little black dots on here are the 204 measurements I made of the location of Barnard Star. This plot is right ascension on the x-axis, declination on the, the y-axis, and so Barnard's moving from the bottom to the top, and it's uh, uh, so it, what was I going to say about that? Oh, so it's going almost due north, just a little bit west of north. And not only is it going bottom to top, it's also wiggling back and forth, and that's due to the parallax. Now, the red line is where I've curved fit my data, and I'm also showing it in the middle plot by itself. This is the path that my heart star takes. It's going to be kind of weird looking if you didn't know what was going on. Now, for my curve fit, I can uh, pull out um, separate terms. I can set the parallax term to zero and look at just proper motion. And so you'll see here it's got about 44 arc seconds, a little over, or in about four years. So it's about 10 arc seconds a year, and that is the value for Barnard star. I can also zero out the proper motion term and just look at parallax. So this is what Barnard's star path would look like if I had no proper motion. Uh, it's going back and forth, covering about one arc second, which means the parallax, which is a half angle, is about half arc second, which is also close to what you expect. So how good are the results actually pull out of the, the curve fit? That's my final chart here. I'm looking at four parameters, looking at the parallax and then the distance of light years you get from that very simply. And then look at the two components of the proper motion. The first column here is from the European Gaia satellite, which measures very accurate star positions, <coughs> most accurate ever done. It costs about a million dollars, and for that money, you get a whole lot of decimal places <coughs> out here. So it's very accurate. I consider this to be the exact answer. I'm over here, I don't have as much money, so I get maybe three decimal places. The, uh, but you can see I did pretty well. Gaia is about 0.547. This is, is the parallax, I'm 0.545, only missing about three tenths of a percent. And of course, the distance worked out the same way. Born our star is about a little over 5.96 light years away. I calculated 5.95. So that's extremely happy with that. My proper motion uh, in right ascension isn't quite as good, 1.4% error. It moves less than an arc second in, in, uh, per year. But then the declination part, the north south part, I'm very close with 20th of a percent. And that's very easy to get that one accurate. Just take pictures for more years and get a more a larger displacement and get a much bigger answer. 
if I'm able to close with saying I'm very proud of that 0.3 number, but to put it in perspective, a 0.3 error in the distance part of our star starts about 99 billion miles. So it's still, I'm still not exactly right on, but it's, uh, it's still, it's 35 trillion miles to the star. So I'm not doing too bad. Cool. So that's what I got. Well, if there's any questions, I kind of flew through that. Do we know if Menard star is moving away? We do. You can from Doppler, and you can look at a Doppler shift of what it is. I don't know what the number is, but it is coming. It's coming towards us right now. Okay. So one of the things that make it, makes it have such large proper motion is it's moving very fast relative to the sun. You know, both stars together kind of go at the same speed around the galaxy. It's kind of an oddball that's kicking down at a funny angle, and that makes it. It being close and it had that large velocity does it, but it also has an uh, radial velocity. You said 1916 it was uh, <laughs> discovered? Why, yeah. Why that's, did, pretty, that's, that's pretty young, right, for a star that close? Well, they didn't know it was that close. It was, it's a you know, 9.5 magnitude star, pretty dim little star, no one knew anything was interesting. And Barnard went and looked at some pictures taken back in the late 1800s. And it's like, whoa, this star has moved quite a bit. And so they realized this thing's got large proper motion, which usually means it's a very close star. <laughs> and so that at that point became the closest star. And nothing, nothing, then Alpha Centauri has surpassed it since then. Maybe I get that far out. The distance again is what? About six light years. Alpha Centauri is four point something light years. Or maybe. Anything else? So. I guess you could see it for a long time, hundreds of years ago. So they just didn't notice it was interesting until 1916. Yeah. So it's not something you can see with the naked eye, you know. So I'm like, well, that star's moving. And, uh, yeah, see it with the telescope. So, you know, really, I mean, you're only talking 10 arc seconds a year, and that was slow enough that in four years, it goes about the width of Jupiter. So it's a uh, pretty slow motion. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, if the rest of you are holding out on us or doing really cool projects like that, let us know. Because he's been hanging around for what, three years now? At least. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't even know he existed. So, look, he's been doing all this great work. <laughs> in that. Okay. Next up, another guy has been doing great work. I guess <laughs> Stan's been doing astrophotography from friends when he's been showing us his pictures lately. And I've been bugging him about coming and doing a presentation, and now here he is. Good evening. I should figure this thing out. Okay, I've uh, been with the club right at a year. I think I started coming in January of this, of this year. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of planetary, uh, tip to Ed there. Seen a lot of your photographs, a lot of your papers, and stuff on Apple. Doing, doing great work, but um, uh, I started doing DSOs this year. Bought some equipment, and I was just fascinated by the technology and the, the great results that even someone just starting out can, can get, even from uh, Mortal Eight skies. Uh, and I, I take all of my photographs from my driveway in Friendswood. I've got uh, this uh, refractor telescope. I won't go through all the details, but I've got a Celestron CGXL mount, and I've got a lot of ZWO equipment, uh, focuser, filter wheel, camera, off-axis guider, and then most importantly, the little ASI Air Plus, which does everything seamlessly. Um, also, uh, all of the images I'm about to show, I've been processing with Cyril, and I left this off. It's a 1.2.0. And as I stated, it's uh, from Friendswood, Portal 8, and uh, I have almost zero setup time because I have my telescope set up on this uh, little buggy that I uh, drag in and out of my garage. So this is M8, Measure 8, Moon Nebula. Uh, it's about 4,100 light years away, and this is uh, actually I combined uh, photographs through two different filters. Both were Optolone, one was a UHC filter, 
and the other was an L Extreme dual narrowband. And uh, both were approximately two hours of two minute exposures that I combined with cereal and processed. And I was really surprised to get some of the colors that I, that I ended up with. Okay. Uh, I heard about the uh, supernova in M101, and I wanted to capture that. So I, uh, back in late May, probably a couple of weeks after the supernova, I think it erupted around May 19th, something like that. Uh, captured uh, over six nights between May 27th and 7 7, uh, integrated 4.4 hours of two minute exposures uh, through only the Optolong UHC filter and uh, <clears throat> processed that and came up with this. The red arrow, of course, points to the supernova 2023 IXF. <clears throat> this is M33 Triangulum Galaxy. I've uh, got a lot of uh, noise, but this is a very low uh, surface brightness galaxy. It's pretty hard to capture, especially from a more light uh, area. But this is uh, over four nights in late, in early through uh, early July through early August. 8.6 hours of two minute exposures through the UHC filter. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I don't know if you're noticing the times that I start my exposures, but I'm an night owl, and uh, I feel like the sky has settled down a little better at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, one thing that uh, I've been reading about, this, this galaxy is really, really interesting. It's got lots of HA uh, clouds, star-forming regions. But this one right here, a lot of these have their own NGC designations. And this one right here is from what I've read is 40 to 50 times the diameter of M42 in our galaxy. So that thing is huge. And my, one of my next projects is I'm going to be taking just hydrogen alpha pictures so that I can pick up all of the hydrogen clouds. And this is the M27 dumbbell nebula that we were talking about back here. Um, it's a planetary nebula, it's about 1,360 light years away. Uh, we've got three hours of integrated two minute exposures using the UHC filter in July, early July. Uh, I was I was really, really tickled when this when I finished processing on this. I just couldn't believe the, the colors that I was able to capture and, and process. And this is the Needle Galaxy, NGC 4565. This one was not this photograph, but on the several months back, Sky and Telescope magazine had a cover photo of this galaxy. But uh, what's really interesting is there's all kinds of other galaxies in the background. And uh, I've read that, I don't know if you can see it up there, but all these little red dots here are galaxies, it's a galaxy cluster a lot further away and this is 30 to 50 million light years away <clears throat> again uh, multiple nights integrated seven hours of one one half and two minute exposures through a uhc filter and uh, to me it's impressive but i'm sure there's some other folks out here that have uh, got a lot more experience and i am gaining more experience but i'm just really really tickled that i'm able to capture such things and uh, I've got one more image that I uh, captured with. Oh, that's a weird effect. I didn't cause that. Um, <laughs> I, this is my wide-angle <clears throat> setup. It's a Red Cat 51. And I've got an electronic focuser and uh, another ZWO ASI Air Plus and guiding this on the AM5. All of the equipment except for the telescope is ZWO. And again, it's Everything works seamlessly. I'm not, I'm not a salesman for ZWO, but I'm really impressed. Uh, again, this was processed using Cyril and from my Friendswood Mortal 8 skies. And that's that image. This is uh, M8, Measure 8, Lagoon Nebula, and the Triffid Nebula, M20, and this is an open cluster, M21. And I'm sure there are some other named objects, probably some other 
open clusters and there's some dark nebulas, but that's a, it's a pretty cool picture of seeing uh, Sagittarius. All of these objects, I was surprised, they're all about the same distance, uh, relatively 4,000 to 4,200 light years away. And uh, I guess they're in the same section of uh, near the center of the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. And this was uh, just one hour of one minute exposures with no filters on uh, June 25th. That's all we got. Any questions? Yes. That mount, was that one of the harmonic tripods? Yes. Without the counterweight? Yeah, how does that, how's that working out? It's working great. It's, I'm getting half or less arc second of tracking. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Without guiding? Without oh, it's, it's, got a, it's got a guiding camera. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's good. good. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. 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 A guiding camera here in the back. Right here. No, no counterweight. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have put an 80 inch F4 reflector on there, and uh, I put a counterweight on it when I use that. Gotcha. But I haven't taken any photographs with a visual. That's a sweet point. setup. Sure. So, uh, Stan, on your first setup, your field flatteners, the William Optics uh, field flatteners, or some, some other brand field flattener? It's the William Optics. It's a 68 uh, A11 or something like that. Okay. <coughs> I bought it at the same time. So, this Petzl design here. Do you see any issues with this one? That's a, that's a wonderful optical. Tool. Well, the, this particular model was the first one, and you can use it visually. Yeah. From what I read, the new version you can't use it visually; it's only photographic. Right. But it doesn't require a field flattener. It's right. Four right. element uh, lens. Uh, but my question but, is: I, I know what Pestle is, but on okay. this this implementation of Pestle, do you see any issues with it? Or is it just basically perfect or what? Right. That's the best thing I've got. I mean, you can see the stars in the corners are right. perfect pin. I mean, it's there's no distortion. Yeah, I think it's a pretty pretty nice setup. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. All right. Two two new guys doing presentations and stay with the Star Party News. <laughs> David. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, oh, my pretty quick. quick. We have one of the report, the hack winery on the 18th of, 18th of, uh, of November. Nothing of books on the books officially yet, but we are planning for six more uh, hack winery events. Evelyn Metter decided that they want us back, and I think a couple of other places are, are, are testing the waters too. So, jumping right in, November 18th, we have winery outreach, thanks to Al Kelly, Stan Lamb, Jerry Campbell, and by Hung Peng, Bob and Leslie Eaton, Connie and David, Ovido Oliveras and Suman Ku, I believe it is. Estimated 125 to 150 in attendance. Um, that was actually pretty good, just uh, except for what you are seeing here. This is one of two portion, two, two bits of competition we had. Occasionally, <laughs> twice during the evening, we had ground fog roll in and go, oh, goody. Um, so, yeah, we had that roll in here off the, on the other side. The other time, this is the first time they booked us against a band. <laughs> Yeah. The band went to about 8.30, they were playing reasonable music, it was okay, but, um, you know, I, try, I will try to make future events without the bands, I'll try, but I can't promise that. Um, I hung and Jerry down over, over here, Bob's getting himself set up. Sorry, Stan, but I kind of got you in slow motion there, <laughs> while you're setting up that one. Oliver is doing this one. I grabbed this, I, I usually do lunar imaging, I grabbed this horrible shot from my phone, but at least uh, um, uh, Nubium is here, and, and the Theophilus with reasonable resolution of the center spur peak. Um, but I figured why not grab that. Um, you have this, have this massive uh, uh, 
SCT out here, and partway through the night, he turned around and just flipped it and dropped this thing on there. So that was that was a that was a pretty cool pretty cool thing, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, where do bad rainbows go? Prism. It's a light sentence, and it gives them time to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last thing, door prizes. Oh, you got the bucket. Thank you. And also, donations needed for door prizes. Um, we're getting kind of little door prizes. If you have any kind of astronomical things that you don't need anymore, that would be great to donate them. Thank you, Reed. All right, so first one. First one. Last three numbers is. Nine five three. All right, Gary, go on down. So we have a lunar map. Lunar map. We have a Starliner mouse pad. We have a DFT one uh, pin. We have a stress an Apollo capsule stress pin. Lunar map. Lunar map. Lunar map. Oh, that's why I trust you. All right, next one. Um, nine five nine. Nine five nine. Five. Nine six. Nine six two. Oh my gosh! Oh. Oh. You guys, oh, guys. It's, so close. it's in the Wait, middle. Are you, uh, Look at that. It's nine, I got nine six one and nine six three. Oh, nine six two. Oh, oh is it? Is Joseph, Joseph, is it you? No, 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 no. We have two in between. We have 961 and then we have 963. What the heck? If you get up and start walking around, I think it's you. 963. Oh, good. You played crap. There it is. Nice. Yeah. Are you 963? I'm 963. Oh, yeah. He's so proud of himself. Okay, we got lunar map. We got a Starliner mouse pad. We got a Apollo capsule stress toy. We have a DFT ones. Uh, and we have STS-106 images, we have STS-98 images. Mm -hmm. You like any? Oh, actually, yes. Good. Two, but see, David's a hit tonight. Everybody wants to see David's next one for us. Okay, last one. Uh, nine five two. Nine five two. Nine five two. Nobody, nobody. Doug. 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 Okay, if I win. Yeah, come on. Okay, Chris. We got a starliner thing. We got a stress toy. We got pictures from missions. We have BFT one sticker. 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 Okay, thank you for coming. Next month, Rodney, who I guess took off already, is our, our speaker. January 12th, Sir Isaac Newton comes to the rescue of gravitational singularity, Dyson Sphere, dark matter, and more no relativity or quantum mechanics needed. I think Rodney was here, but now he's gone. Yeah, he was right there. Okay, so see you at Mod Pizza. Thanks for coming. Oh, Reed, thanks for being our doorman. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you.